Well, now in Zero Block 30, I am privileged to have Medal of Honor recipient, fantastic man. He lives in West Virginia, born and bred. He is Woody Williams. We are so happy to have you, Mr. Williams. Thank you for joining us. Yeah, certainly my pleasure, Chaps. So I want to talk to you and go back to the 1940s because you didn't just try to join the Marine Corps right when things were getting going, right at Pearl Harbor. You tried to join a little bit before, right? Well, no. In uh, 1941, when Pearl Harbor was struck, I happened to be in the what was called the Civilian Conservation Corps. Okay. And uh, in that corps, that group, you could go in when you were 16 years old. And uh, President Roosevelt started that program nationwide to try to give the youth something to do where they could possibly learn a trade because the depression was on, there were just no jobs and a bunch of young people didn't have anything to do. So it ended up there about, I don't know, 700,000 of us served in the Civilian Conservation Corps. So I was in Montana, White Hall, Montana, the day the Pearl Harbor was bombed. And they called us out the day uh, after, on the 8th, and <clears throat> about 265 of us in that camp. And those camps were run by the Army. We had a commanding officer. We had a first sergeant and a best sergeant and a few uh, Army clerks that did all the administrative work. And they called us out and told us that Pearl, that we were going to war. And of course, President Roosevelt had already announced that. And uh, that we could have a choice. If we were over 18 years of age, we could go direct into the Army. We wouldn't have to even go home. But I was only 17. And if under 18, of course, you had to have parent consent. And my mother lived back in West Virginia. My father was already deceased. So there was no way in the world I could ever get to consent. So I took the option of coming home. And uh, <clears throat> after I got home, I wanted to join still at 17, but uh, my mother would not sign my paper to give me permission. So I had to wait until I was 18. And one month after my 18th birthday in October, I went into the, into the town and there was one building where all the services were gathered, all the branches of services. And I wanted to be a Marine. I didn't want to be an army guy. I didn't want to wear that out of the army uniform. Same for me. Set of dress clothes and all that. <laughs> and uh, so, when I filled out my paper and gave it to the Marine, uh, he didn't even, I don't think, looked at my paper, he just looked at me and he said, you're too short, I can't take you. And they did have a height requirement at that time of 5'8 or better. So I went back, back to the farm, there wasn't anything else I could do. And uh, I would have eventually been drafted and ended up in the Army, of course. But uh, in early 1943, the Marine Corps already would begin having casualties because of Water Canal, mm -hmm. which was hit in 42. And of course, lots of campaigns were planned, <clears throat> apparently. So they lowered the height requirement. And uh, that Marine, I am sure, turned down a, a great number of us because in our community, we had a lot of Italian people mm -hmm. and they, were, they mostly were short like me. They didn't meet that, high, uh, that height requirement either. So he came, but he came to the farm and looked me up and said, do you still want to go to the Marine Corps? And I said, yes. And okay. <laughs> See, and that's when recruiting gets tough. We have that same type of thing now where they, at first, if you had a certain amount of tattoos, they weren't letting you in. A couple well, of years into the war on terror, they're like, well, maybe we'll let a few people win with tattoos. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. So, uh, in 43, I finally shipped off. We had a waiting period back then. There were so many people taking two people into the Marine Corps from each county. And two of us from my county, and then we had two other guys from adjoining counties 
uh, and six of us got selected to go into the Marine Corps. And instead of going to Paris Island, which we should have gone, because we were East Coast, mm -hmm. uh, they sent us all the way to San Diego. Because Paris Island was getting so many people, they couldn't find real instructors and didn't have housing and, you know, that sort of thing. So they began shipping train loads of people to California. So when you were actually on the boats and getting ready to start doing the island hopping campaigns, did you have any inclination about what to expect? Were your intelligence briefs good? Or were you basically you get off the ship and it's time to fight? <laughs> basically, that was it. But we were fortunate in my platoon. Uh, we did have, uh, we had three year old instructors. And two of those individuals had already been in Guad Guadalcanal. Mm -hmm. So they were combat experience. And that was beneficial because they were talking the reality of combat. But you take the other drill instructors that have never been overseas yet, they couldn't help them. So as you said, you didn't know what you were going to get into when you went to the beach. So did... With men like that, whenever you have, I assume, guys like John Bassalon that were on the ship that had this reputation, were you already looking at the people who had been in Guanacanal and thinking, thank goodness they're here, so we have a little bit of experience on our side? I, I don't know that we thought that way, but when they uh, was teaching us or talking to us, particularly those two individuals, they could talk in reality. Mm -hmm. and warn you and, and give you uh, basic information uh, of things not to do to be safe, uh, not get yourself killed. So uh, that was helpful. And I think of somebody like yourself, whenever I heard stories or I'd read stories and see it on documentaries and things like that, of people who were flamethrowers, essentially, of being big guys because they weigh 70 pounds and you, I would think you would be almost like a machine gunner now where you want to be bigger and stockier. So when I hear your story being turned away for being on the smaller side, it's mind blowing that that's the job that you were picked for. <laughs> well, <laughs> most of us, uh, there were uh, uh, actually uh, seven of us in this special weapons unit that was set up on uh, Guadalcanal. Uh, in January of 44, <clears throat> we received these huge wooden crated boxes and we had no idea what they were, what was in those. But when we opened them up, there was a piece of equipment none of us had ever seen before, a flamethrower. <laughs> we didn't know what it was or how to use it. And it's not uh, like you could go on YouTube and check it out. <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly right. And uh, it didn't have any manual of how to use it in combat. It did have a manual that showed you all the part numbers and how to take it apart and put it together. And it came with a powdered phosphorus, a powder that had phosphorus in it. And that was what you were supposed to use in those flamethrowers. You'd mix that with gasoline and it would turn into a gel a sticky, real sticky gel. Well, if you got that on your body or you got it on the enemy, the phosphorus continued to burn and there was no way you could brush it off. Uh, you could even stick your hand underwater. If you got it on your hand, you could stick your hand underwater and the phosphorus still burned. It wow. didn't make any difference, you know. So that was the material that they sent us, but it was a single stream, like a water stream out of the water hose. And you only had 72 seconds of fluid in your door, four and a half gallons of stuff. And the air pressure, air tank would force it out in 72 seconds. So by the time when you're trying to hit a target with it and you can't aim, you're firing from the hip. You know, now you can't sight it like a rifle. Yeah, there's no iron sights on that thing. <laughs> That's right. Those guys would be out of fluid before you'd ever find the target if it wasn't a you know a big thing. So my gunnery sergeant, who happened to be a jet a China Marine, he was in China during the Depression years in the 30s, 
he began experimenting with other stuff, other kinds of fluids, and we finally ended up with diesel fuel and airplane gasoline. And My goodness. The mixture of that, that he he worked it out, and he was satisfied with it, and that's what we used. Now, I imagine just knowing Marines, because we like to think of you guys, the Iwo Jima <laughs> veterans, where you are just stoic warriors. But I know deep down inside, the first time you guys lit that thing on fire, everybody started to cheer. And you're like, oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> you are absolutely right. It was something we had never experienced before. And uh, the because of the mixture of gasoline, of course, gasoline, if you just throw it or or send it out under pressure, once it hits wind resistance, it stops. It doesn't go very far. So the diesel fuel gave it body so that it would go farther. But even at that, if you fired it into the air, say body height or head height, it still wouldn't go anywhere because the wind resistance would catch it and it just stopped. And uh, so this gunnery sergeant came up with the idea of firing it 15, 20 yards in front of you on the ground into a great big orange fireball and rolling that ball into a cave or a pillbox. Mm. And I don't know whether any other units use that system or not. I have no idea. I've, I've watched some of the film that looks like they're firing uh, about body level. And uh, what they were using in the way of fluid to give it body, I have no idea. And using a weapon like that has got to be, for the person on the other end of the trigger, horrific. Like the things that you see, and seeing that you wear the medal still, you're wearing the medal today for those that are listening while they're driving to work or doing whatever they're doing. I look at somebody like you and imagine telling a story like yours over and over again for 70 years now has got to take a toll mentally. Did you ever feel like you were able to really heal from those moments by having to replay essentially the worst day of your life over and over again, or days of your life? Well, you know, we didn't, we didn't know anything about PTS. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that wasn't something that we had come up with yet. Uh, in World War II, the diagnosis of a person who had some PTS, as we call it today, we called it psychoneuroses. And of course, most people in combat had some form of that to some degree. <clears throat> but the uh, best thing that happened to me, really, was that by virtue of having the Medal of Honor, I became a public figure. Mm -hmm. I had to participate in public. I was expected to tell my story. I was expected to associate and answer questions and have programs like you and I are doing today, only we did it by radio or speech. And that's the best thing that ever happened to me because it was a therapy. Mm. I couldn't keep it pinned up inside of me mm. because I had to talk about it. And, and that helped. It really did. Was, so you've basically been doing group therapy for 75 years. <laughs> that's exactly right. Yeah. I mean, it, you know, I didn't know it at the time, but uh, it really was beneficial uh, to me. And uh, But it still took many years to finally get it to the point where uh, uh, it didn't keep me awake anymore. Okay. Good. And I, I've talked to Kyle Carpenter a few times about this same type of thing, because you were a young man when you received the Medal of Honor as well. It's got to be almost at days where you just, you didn't want to talk about things that happened and you had to put on a happy face just because you were uh, aware of the medal. And now being the last Marine from World War II that's still with us is just, your life has just been so remarkable. When you look around at America now, do you have any wisdom that you would like to impart on our younger listeners of things that they could do better to be better people? Well, somewhere I, I feel, uh, chaps, that we, we have lost our value of our country, our patriotism, 
we don't look at America today like we did in World War II, World War I or World War II, and for that matter, uh, Korea or Vietnam. We're not looking at the same world through the eyes of our youth today that even you look through in uh, Fallujah, uh, because our values are changing or have changed so rapidly, uh, we're losing that high respect and regard for the very freedom that we have and the privilege of living in such a great country as America. And I don't know how to restore that. If I, uh, I'm anxious to about the fact that we can't gather together as a united people like we were uh, in previous years. I think, and I've said this many times in many places, I believe we're more divided today than we have ever been other than the Civil War. And these riots and things that are going on today just further convinces me that somehow we've got to restore in America the true America that we all want to have and true Americans that we want to be. And you do a lot of that with your foundation and focusing on the relationships that you build with gold star families and those that are sacrificing for the ability to express freedom of speech and freedom of protest and things like that. Can you tell us about why your passion sh shifted so much to the gold star families? Well, if I could back up for just a moment, the gold star mothers were started in World War I, as you no, no doubt know. <clears throat> And for years, we we talked a lot about, and many communities paid tribute and honor to Gold Star Mothers. But no one ever mentioned any other part of the family. And uh, in a few years back, <clears throat> probably around 2010 or that period, uh, I was speaking to a group of uh, senior citizens and. Uh, and we had gold star mothers in the group. Uh, some of those mothers had lost loved ones in the death march, in, you know, the Japan death march, and, uh, and in the Philippines when it was captured. So we paid proper tribute to them. And after this whole thing was over and one man stayed in the hall and uh, I asked him, you know, could I be of some help to him? And he walked up to me and tears were flowing down his cheeks. And I had talked about Gold Star Mothers over and over and over because they suffered mm -hmm. the loss of a loved one, their own. And he walked, when he walked up to me, all he said to me was, dads cry too. Mm -hmm. And I had never mentioned dad. And all the effort that we'd made or the talks that we'd given and whatever, no one had ever mentioned dad. And uh, I decided at that time, you know, we've got a memorial on our Capitol grounds that has 11,434 names on it. And every one of those sacrificed their life in the armed forces. We certainly have paid proper tribute to them but we didn't do anything to pay honor and tribute to their families. And it's the families that's left behind who are suffering, who are grieving, who has an empty place at the table. So I decided we must do something to honor our own in West Virginia. And we did that in 2013, built the first Gold Star Family Memorial ever constructed in the United States of America in this little state of West Virginia. And we did it for our own, thinking that's all we're gonna do. Uh, when we applied for our, uh, for our uh, program, uh, nonprofit, they said, you gotta have a goal. I said, okay, goal will be one of these in every state. See, they yeah. shouldn't even be able to tell you what you need. You should be able to say, I wanna start a foundation. And they say, Mr. Williams, okay. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> you clear your flamethrower on Iwo Jima. You get to start any foundation you want to. <laughs> but other states began to pick it up. And uh, the second one was really Valley Forge. Can you think of a more appropriate place than Valley Forge? That's right. And it was the son of a father that had lost his life in Vietnam that said, well, we need one of these in our community to represent our gold star families, you know. And then it began to move forward. And, and today, not because of what I did, it's because what the communities are doing. People in communities, if you give them the opportunity and the right circumstances, they will do anything to serve our country, help it in some way, rather than destroy it. And today, in 45 states, we have already have a monument completed. And we're going to get the others before we're finished. It, it, it's just a matter of time. But we've got 70 more in process. Mm. So I'm so proud of our little state of West Virginia, because right now we already have seven. And uh, five more on the books or in the process. So we're going to end up with 12, and at that point, if we get those completed next year, we'll be ahead of any other state in the union. Well, that'll be two things that you guys have, the best fall leaf changes and the first <laughs> dedicated memorial to all the fallen families. Yes, sir. <laughs> um, I want to ask you one more question about EWO. When you all were coming back, when the island campaigns were over, because I think a lot of people lose sight that – they see such a monumental moment in the raising of the flag on Mount Sarabachi. But that wasn't the end of the island campaign for you guys. You guys had to pick up from Iwo and move on and continue island hopping. But when it was finally done and you were on your way home, did you have any idea what you had accomplished and that you would be the backbone of the legacy of the United States Marine Corps? Absolutely not. <laughs> Absolutely not. It was uh, Iwo Jima, as far as we were concerned, was just another campaign. Uh, we had been in Guam the year before, in July and August, and we had taken Guam back from the enemy. And this was just another campaign. The thing that made it iconic, I think, was Old Glory. The fact that she was on a mountaintop where everybody on the island could see her. Now, we put a flag up on every island we ever captured, you know. Mm -hmm. But you couldn't, once you got out of the area, you couldn't see her. It's out of mind, out of sight. But with uh, Mount Sirabachi, you couldn't miss it. I mean, it's the highest point on the whole island, and the island was only, you know, it was only two and a half miles wide and four and a half miles long. So you can see four and a half miles if it's up in the air. And uh, So I think it was the flag that made it such an iconic situation, more so than uh, just taking the island. Oh, no doubt about it. Mr. Williams, I don't want to take up too much of your time. I, it's such an honor to be able to interview you and speak with you man to man, person to person. And I, again, for the legacy that you've left behind and for the, things that you do now currently like I don't know if a lot of people listen know but our Kyle Carpenter and I sat at the Coca-Cola 600 a couple years ago and I asked him some of the same questions that I asked you today about what it was like receiving the Medal of Honor and having almost some some of the burden that was there and he told me he said you know I had men like Woody Williams reach out to me after I found out that I was going to receive the Medal of Honor. And he kind of took me under his wing and told me what to expect a little bit. And I thought that that kind of thing is what goes unnoticed. It's the type of leadership that happens behind the scenes. And it really is what makes people like you and your generation very special. And I hope that while everything that's going on that's so turbulent in America right now, we can receive some of that sacrifice, that sacrifice to take some, some of the things that we have for granted and look at the future and say, you are the future. Just like Kyle Carpenter is going to be sitting in your seat 60 years from now talking to some other bald-headed veteran about the things that he accomplished <laughs> in Marja. And I hope that this is, it continues to go on because of legacies like you, people like you, Ms. Williams. Yes, and we must not ever forget 
those of today. We're still having, we're still having Americans sacrifice their life for somebody else and for a cause greater than themselves. And uh, when they first start talking about having an all volunteer forces, I was the doubting Thomas, I really was. I didn't think we would ever be able to have enough true Americans who are willing to sign an oath and go to combat, not knowing if they're ever going to get back home. But it has worked and worked beautifully. And you still have those individuals who sacrifice their life for somebody else. But that, you can't get any better than that so far as loyalty is concerned. Absolutely right. Thank you, Mr. Williams. Good job.